Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone to this Space Education and Strategic Applications Conference 2023. Uh, this is the second session in room two. Uh, this morning we got an uh, amazing uh, trailing panel on ethical considerations in space. Uh, we have doc Dr. Christopher Impey and Dr. Conrad Sasek. Uh, we will begin with Dr. Christopher Impey. Uh, he is a university distinguished professor from the University of Arizona, and he will acknowledge uh, the topic of ethics in the final frontier. Uh, professor Christopher Impey, you have uh, half an hour, uh, and after that, uh, we will hear Dr. Conrad Sasik. And by the end of the two presentations, we will have a uh, time for Q and A's. So please, if you have any question, uh, you will find uh, that in option in your chat in the Zoom session. Just feel free to write it down and we will acknowledge that by the final part of it. So that will be it. Thank you for being here. And uh, Professor uh, Chris Impey, uh, go ahead. Uh, the space is all yours. <laughs> OK, I'm pleased to be here and happy to be part of this conference. Um, I'm going to talk about the some of the big issues that arise from our uh, progress in space, our development of space, which is moving very fast. Um, so I'm going to frame a set of issues and be quite broad. I got interested in this subject as an astronomer a few years ago when I saw the commercial private, uh, the commercial and private space industry booming. So I wrote a book a few years ago called Beyond. That's how I did a lot of research on this. Um, and so there are some concerns as we see space travel growing. We have some very ambitious billionaires, uh, notably Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Um, who are have very aggressive plans for space travel, for satellites, for colonizing the moon and Mars. And then for some of the population, this seems irrelevant. For some of the population, um, we have big problems on the Earth. Right now, the UN General Assembly is meeting and they're really worried about climate change. And, and so for some people, it seems uh, not a waste of time and money maybe to do space travel. I would argue that it has some value uh, even as we must take care of our problems on the earth. Also, we should acknowledge that space is not a natural place for humans to be. It is a brutal environment uh, and it's difficult and expensive to keep people alive and prosperous in space. Astronomers and planetary scientists have known for a long time that it is much cheaper, much better, much more reliable to use robotic probes and our robots are very capable now and getting better all the time. So there's a question of whether people really need to be up there. And then there's the issue of space junk or space debris, which I'll talk about, which is just getting worse and is potentially going to be uh, stopping the entire activity in the worst case. And then another concern on more on the social political front is that perhaps if there's no rules and regulations in space, which really there aren't, um, this will be a revisiting of the worst sins of colonialism on a brand new tapestry, a brand new landscape of outer space. So those are the concerns. I can't address all of them, but I will raise them at the beginning. We should remember that this is a young activity. Humans have been human for 50,000 years, maybe. We've had the Industrial Revolution for three or 400 years, but we've only had computers and space travel for 50 or 60 years, and only 650 people have ever been in Earth orbit. And for most of the history of this activity, it had a strange context of a geopolitical contest between the world's two superpowers, uh, Soviet Union and, and the United States. So this is the early phase of the space activity, and we don't really know, and it's hard to predict how it will play out. Um, NASA sometimes get criticized for lack of ambition, but here's the reason for their lack of ambition. NASA's budget has declined uh, the peak at Apollo was an unsustainable amount of money that could that was already in reverse when the last Apollo missions were canceled. Uh, the Vietnam War was expensive for America. So NASA's budget went down. But if you notice, in the last 20 years, the budget has gone down by a factor of two in real terms. So NASA tries to do more with less. Uh, and NASA has a other problem that it doesn't tend to get into the news. 
unless something really bad happens or they need money. That's not always true. James Webb Space Telescope has been in the news for good reasons. The new space race is with China, not with Russia. Russia is now a moderately poor country engaged in a ruinously expensive war with the Ukraine. China, however, is coming on strong. And in the last, last year, 2022, they had almost as many launches to Earth orbit as the United States. And that number has been growing steadily over time. They have very ambitious space programs. So this is the new space race among countries. But what most people are aware of is that there's a very booming private sector. Now this started with the X Prize, which was awarded uh, to, was won in 2004, almost 20 years ago by Bert Rutan for repeat suborbital flight. And this incentive prize was what really kicked off the private space industry. So that's when it all started. But for a while, this didn't seem very relevant to most people. Uh, we had less than a dozen space tourists who paid tens of millions of dollars uh, to go into orbit or to the space station. Um, it did, just didn't seem relevant to most people. But that's changed. Now at least three major space companies are actually almost 30 worldwide. Uh, we have the spaceship company with billionaire Richard Branson. Um, and this was the company that he used Bert Rutanis as designer for. And they've had a disaster and loss of life. So they've been set back, but they have 50,000 expressions of interest for people willing to pay a quarter of a million dollars for a brief suborbital flight. Blue Origin was founded um, by Jeff Bezos, the billionaire Amazon CEO, and he keeps it afloat by selling a billion dollars in stock every year. And he sent 14 tours to space in 2021. That was a record of civilians in space in one year. SpaceX gets in the news more often, founded in the same year by as uh, Blue Origin by Elon Musk. And he has a lot of bluster and he has a lot of outrageous things, but they have also delivered. Um, the Falcon 9 rocket has had 260 launches, only two of which were failures. That's an amazing success rate. Um, and they also have revenue coming in from a partnership with NASA because the business model for this private space industry is not yet mature. These are the space pioneers familiar to most people, the ones in the news, Richard Branson, Elon Musk. Peter Diamandis was the uh, architect of the X Prize, which is a series of prizes. Bert Rutan is the aircraft designer. Uh, there's Jeff Bezos of Amazon and uh, Yuri Milner, a sort of uh, Russian industrialist who's put a lot of money into space travel. These are big rockets now. Elon Musk's new ambitious rocket is on the right, and it is for the first time eclipsing the mighty Saturn V that took astronauts to the moon over 50 years ago. But the reusable rocket that he's going to use for Mars and the moon is hundreds of times cheaper per launch than the Saturn V, which was not reusable, or only parts were reusable. So this is a new game, and it is a game where it's getting better and easier to go into orbit. Now, it's not completely safe. People will die. The graph here is the fatality rate in civil aviation, uh, and it declined by a factor of 100 after the Second World War into the modern era, through just due to safety measures and redundancy and better electronics and so on. And the space industry is is working in this model. They imagine that it may be hazardous in the early phase, in the pioneering phase, and people may die, um, but that they have a viable business model and so it will flourish and sustain. The economics is again driven by very rich people. Here are some of the numbers of people have spent, Musk, Branson, on the uh, space effort from their private fortune. If you look at the number of billionaires in the world, there's a lot of them. A handful of them could rival NASA's entire budget for a year easily with their own personal fortune if they chose to. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that in Fortune magazine's list of the world's richest people, the two richest people on the planet are the CEOs of the two prominent private space organizations, Blue Origin and SpaceX. I made a comparison between space travel and the movies because we think about space, maybe it's for entertainment and recreation. So here, since the dawn of the space age is the average cost of a space mission, there's a big variation. So I show some expensive and cheap space missions. And here's the average cost of a movie in Hollywood. And here are some cheaper and expensive versions. And you'll notice these curves crossed about five years ago. The average movie now costs more than the average space mission, which is kind of remarkable. 
And for people who question the value of astronomy and space science, I point out that if you had $400 million burning a hole in your pocket, you could hire a good director, a great director, James Cameron, make a movie about life on an exomoon, Avatar, or you could build a one meter spacecraft that will find and did find hundreds of Earth-like planets. The real science costs the same. So the science is actually a pretty good deal. I'll make an analogy in the development of space with the development of the internet. There are roughly four phases. The pioneering phase, that picture is of J.R. Licklider who wrote a position paper, a white paper for the RAND Corporation, fully envisaging the wireless internet, handheld computing devices, in 1960, when the average mainframe computer is the size of a small house. Then the activity is incubated in the military industrial sector, where there's a lot of money available, and that's where the internet was first derived. Uh, then it moves into a research arena, more public, and we know that uh, CERN was the place where the web browser was first developed. And then finally, in 1995, we have what I think is the explosive growth of the commercial internet uh, with the founding of Amazon with the development of search uh, from two grad students working at Stanford and the first internet service providers. And my point is looking back from 2023 to 1995, I doubt anyone could have predicted in 1995 that the internet would be a four or five trillion dollar component of the world economy and how pervasive it would be in our lives. So maybe it's the same path with space. You have the pioneering phase, there's Robert Goddard, with his first liquid powered rocket traveling barely 100 meters across a frozen cabbage patch. Uh, then you have incubation by the military industrial complex, Werner Braun Braun. Uh, his Nazi past was scrubbed clean when the Americans spirited him away from uh, the end of the second war and he became the architect of the Saturn V. And then the research arena with the International Space Station, the space shuttle, these were expensive things though, and they were not really sustainable given the money available. And so sometime around now, I predict, is in hindsight what will be the Big Bang or the explosive growth and birth of the commercial space sector. And perhaps 25 years from now, looking back, we'll be hard pressed to have predicted where it would get to. There are small satellites too. It's not just putting people into space. Miniaturization and electronics have lowered the bar for going into Earth orbit. And if you attach uh, a solar sail to a small spacecraft with full electronic components, you can reach the entire solar system. And so this is something that's also happening now. The number of these satellites is going up enormously. You can see the prodigious growth, especially of the Starlink satellites in orange on that graph. There's a prediction that for with mostly small satellites, there could be 100,000 satellites in low Earth orbit by the end of the decade. That's, a, that's an enormous number, and it's creating a real problem of space debris. Another issue is, of course, the law, because there is no law up there at all. There have only been two international space treaties, um, and the Outer Space Treaty of 67 was a very important. It banned weapons, nuclear weapons, especially in space, and was signed by all the major spacefaring powers. But the only other moon treaty, or the only other treaty was the moon treaty, which covered the rights and ownership of space objects, the moon and asteroids and so on. It's never been signed by any of the major spacefaring powers. And it only talked about countries and didn't talk about individuals or corporations. So it's essentially a lawless place up there in space. The junk that I alluded to caused by the enormous number of satellites, which degrade, collide, break into small pieces, Occasionally bad actors come in. The Chinese blew up one of their own satellites and created almost 4,000 pieces of debris, each of which could take out another satellite or spacecraft. So that's very antisocial behavior. Combination of these things has created a situation where it's possible that low Earth orbit becomes unusable if we don't do something. And mitigating these uh, large number of small objects, you can see there's million that are centimeter or larger and 100 million that are a millimeter or larger. Doesn't sound like much, a millimeter, but a millimeter object traveling at 10 times the speed of a bullet can puncture a spacecraft or take out uh, sensitive electronics or a spacesuit. So these are dangerous things. And we really don't know how to clean up that space environment. And there's no motivation for individual countries to do it and lose uh, you know, primacy in the space. It's called the tragedy of the commons. So this is an issue we're gonna have to deal with somehow. 
there's a contamination issue, and at least NASA and most of the space agencies in Europe are trying very hard not to litter uh, space or contaminate, for example, Mars with possible microbes, given that we want to look for life on Mars. So there are worries about forward contamination, terrestrial material arriving on other worlds, or backward contamination when we bring back uh, Mars rock samples planned for the end of the decade. And there are protocols for dealing with this. So this issue, at least by the major space agencies, is, is being addressed. A deeper issue, which is a socio-political issue, is that of environmentalism. How are we gonna treat space? How are we gonna treat objects in space? Are we gonna use the model of the United States national parks where they are preserved for everyone to enjoy, but we don't alter them, or we alter them as little as we can, we keep them pristine? Or is it gonna be a revisiting of the American idea of manifest destiny where the dominant culture gets to dominate the rest of the world colonialism. And in the projection of that into space, we can imagine how that will go. Remember, there's no law in space, not just law about who owns what, but there's no law about human rights. None of the United Nations jurisdictions mean anything off Earth. It would have to be invented from scratch. So we are in a strange and exciting time. The record set in 2021, and some were eclipsed in 2022, were the most private investment in space, most successful launches, the most people in space at any one time since the big, since the dawn of the space age, since 1957. The youngest and the oldest astronaut, the oldest one well known to everyone as uh, James Kirk from Star Trek. And I'd say this future that I've been talking about is right here now. The upper graph is the history of launches from countries. You can see the United States and Soviet Union dominating for the first few decades. And then in the last decade, you can see China coming up fast, as I alluded to. The lower graph is the commercial sector, and it didn't really exist before the mid 1980s, but now it's come to rival the space bearing activities of all the world's governments put together. And in terms of sheer number of launches, both of the last two years broke the record of the most launches to Earth orbit since the dawn of the space age. So you can see how rapid this change is and this progress. What's driving this, of course, is reusability of rockets from SpaceX and Blue Origin. And this is the cost per kilo to deliver payload to Earth orbit. And you can see in the last part of these red bars that in the 10 years of the 2010s, the cost per kilo went down by a factor of 10. A 10 times improvement in a decade is, is a remarkable gain. And $1,000 per kilo multiplied by your weight, you can see that you could project this a decade and it'll cost no more than a very expensive or fancy cruise to go into Earth orbit. And if you project this further with other technologies, getting into space might become so cheap that it's essentially free. So what's on the horizon? I'm gonna play out the future a little bit and then wrap up. Um, people are going to go to the moon. Um, there was a one of the few failures in this arena was the Google Lunar X Prize, which the deadline passed for sending rovers for private organizations or universities to send rovers to the moon, travel 500 meters and send back uh, images or data. Nobody won the Lunar X Prize, but people are going to the moon. India's been there very recently. China's been there. Russia's been there. Uh, Emirates is going there. So we the number of spacefaring powers interested in the moon is growing. And it, and again, there's no limit to commercial activity. So we imagine that the moon is going to get commercialized at some level. And how people feel about that, well, maybe that's a source of discussion. We play out a little further into the future, there's a possibility of a space elevator. This is a cable that travels, that is hung in space, where the weight of the cable is balanced by centrifugal force of the spinning Earth. Now, there is no material that could make a, a cable like this on the Earth yet. There are actually nanotube materials that could do an elevator on the moon, and I think that's where it will happen first. But a space elevator changes everything, because at that point, you don't have the cost of rocket fuel getting off the Earth against the gravity. You can have solar-powered lifters essentially raising payloads to Earth orbit for free. And remember, half the energy cost of getting to Mars' surface comes from the first 300 miles getting off the Earth, out of the Earth's gravity. So this would be a game changer. Another thing that we imagine happening in the next few decades is mining asteroids. 
economic progress on the earth has always been fueled by access to cheap minerals and metals. And we know that there are about 100 near-Earth asteroids that are half a kilometer or larger in diameter that could be captured into a, a captive Earth moon orbit where the rough value of the platinum group metals is $2 trillion and about $2 trillion for all the rare Earths. These are vital commodities on the Earth and they're strategically important and they're often in the hands of uh, countries where you don't have friends there so you can't get those materials. You also can get water from these asteroids and you need water obviously to drink you need to separate it for oxygen to breathe and hydrogen into rocket fuel so water is an essential ingredient of living and working in space and eventually we will have bases on mars and just to make this a little more evocative and uh, animated a little bit i'll remind people that when we do go to mars mars has there are two sides to the mars coin mars can be beautiful and it can be nasty um, we imagine that people are going to modify their genes. So one of the ethical issues that will arise is over genetic modification. Uh, these will be radically forward, technology forward people, the colonists, I imagine. And so they're going to biohack themselves. They're going to modify their genes in ways that are not done on Earth or may not even be legal on Earth. And I think we can expect that to happen. So again, Mars is in our future. So Mars can be beautiful and also Mars can be pretty rough. Now I'll play out the last visionary piece of this. Uh, we're talking about the solar system. We're talking about the moon, Mars, and mostly low Earth orbit, which is really not that far. It's like a day's drive straight up, you know, put it in perspective. Reaching to the stars is quite ambitious. And there's at least one project that hopes to do that. Let's break through Starshot. Uh, it plans to create little nanobots uh, with solar sails attached and accelerate them to 5% of the speed of light using beamed radiation, microwave radiation from the earth and, or very powerful lasers. Uh, these would be amazingly powerful. This is the sum of all the world's lasers, basically. So enormous amount of energy required. Um, and they're pretty tiny objects. There are maybe a few grams, but they have all the sensors they need. And the target of this is Proxima Centauri, the nearest star, which seems to have at least one Earth-like planet and possibly more. And so we could go directly in two generations, two human generations at 5% of the speed of light, 4.4 4 light years, and directly explore the nearest star and its Earth-like planets. An extraordinary project. Um, very visionary, many engineering challenges. Not clear when they'll do this or if they can do it, but it's certainly under consideration. And this is just a little animation of, of how they plan to do it. Um, there will obviously be fleets of these nanobots because an individual nanobot may go off course or may get destroyed by uh, impacts from space junk in the vacuum of interplanetary space. So you have to send a whole fleet. You also have a very short time, unless you figure out how to decelerate them at the target, you only have a short time for them to visit this area and take pictures and send back data. So you need a lot of redundancy of these objects as they travel through space. Interesting prospect, isn't it? If we can go to the nearest star at a fraction of the speed of light with our robotic probes, not people, uh, then any civilization that could do that could essentially explore the galaxy in a small fraction of its age, 10 million years or so. And the question is, has anyone else done this? Uh, this is, of course, the question that Fermi asked when he said, where are they? Because we're on the cusp of being able to do this ourselves. So that's playing the future of space quite far into the future, but these are projects that are underway. Clever people are trying to think how we might leave the solar system for the first time.
So to summarize, we've got a very exciting time in space. Um, perhaps the cost will come down, that it's a thing that most people, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people can do, not just super rich people or billionaires, but middle class people, um, recreation for the masses. Now, one thing to rebut the people who say it's just a waste of time, we shouldn't spend any money doing on it. It is true that to learn how to live on the moon or Mars or even in Earth orbit and be self-sufficient, you have to have a very parsimonious use of energy, materials, you have to generate everything you need right there. And those technologies are valuable for the Earth. We can apply those technologies to live in a more self-contained way on the Earth. So in that sense, they're demonstrations of things we can use down on Earth to do better for our planet. I do think we'll eventually have mastery of the solar system. Maybe not people all the way through it, but certainly the robotic probes will explore it in its fullness. And the space elevator also has a little upside the upside is that it's, it's free to launch metric tons of material to Earth orbit and then eject them into deep space. We have a final answer for our problem of toxic and nuclear waste. At the moment, we just bury it deep underground in the oceans where it's not really totally safe, or rich countries pay poor countries to take it, which is extremely unethical. So here with the space elevator, we could actually solve this problem once and for all. Interesting for social scientists and politicians and visionaries and science fiction writers is we're going to see some socio-political experiments play out. And if you're familiar with science fiction, think of your most dystopic or utopian scenario, and we'll probably see those and everything in between play out as people live off Earth. And it is a clean slate, tabula rasa, for law, for ethics, and for policy. So hopefully more people, more smart people, will move into this field to try and figure out the frameworks by which we live and work in space in the future, because it is coming. And I don't think this is the end of anything. I think it's just the end of the beginning. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation, Dr. Christopher Impey. And, uh, 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 I will give the word to uh, Professor Conrad Sasik from University uh, of Reza uh, the, in the Information Technology and uh, Management Department. Uh, Professor Conrad will talk about uh, can we do more in space than on Earth? That's a feminist, uh, sorry for the noise on my side, a feminist perspective on the bioethics of the space exploration. Uh, so yes, Professor Conrad, please uh, go ahead. Feel free to uh, share your screen. And to the attendees, uh, remember you can use the bottom uh, uh, of Q&A to add all your comments and questions uh, will be addressed by the end of the, the presentation. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Professor Conrad. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is my pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Uh, so um, I, I am a philosopher, so I, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of my thoughts uh, about uh, ab about the way how um, about one of possible approaches to uh, philosophy and ethics of uh, space exploration, uh, most especially from the perspective of uh, feminist ethics. I, I find it a little bit challenging, uh, at least for this reason that um, it seems that um, the idea of space exploration as well as the idea of future space settlement if something like this will ever come uh, it looks like they don't match that uh, what feminist philosophy offers and discusses in general uh, can be uh, only hardly applied to the context of uh, of space missions uh, anyway i i would like to um, present in my uh, speech um few uh, three topics the first one it there includes some consideration about let's say some some kind of methodological consideration uh, what philosophy about space what what our philosophical thinking and philosophical consideration considerations about space can be 
the next the next point is uh, something related to the relatively near future in space. I mean the concept of human enhancement. And uh, the last case, which I would like to briefly discuss, related definitely to very far future, it's uh, the issue of human reproduction, something like this uh, will ever happen in space. What kind of difficulties uh, we could meet? And this is my, uh, my book published this year about the bioethics of space exploration by Oxford University Press. But what I would like to present today it's it's uh, the uh, the main theme of my next book, also expected to be published uh, by Oxford University Press, uh, probably in next year. So, uh, regarding our um, philosophical considerations about space, we are usually optimists or or pessimists. I mean that, um, or we share our enlightenment faith in progress, or on the other side. We are very skeptical about humanity, mostly in the context of overpopulation, in the context of climate change, in the context of environmental destruction. And um, this kind of attitudes we usually bring with us uh, to the context of our thinking about, uh, about our, uh, our place in space and, uh, and space exploration and uh, of course I, I think that um, philosophy of uh, space exploration should be somewhere between um, optimism and pessimism and I think that uh, we shouldn't ignore um, all possible threats and risks we should make something like a kind of risk analysis of course in philosophy we don't have any measurable methods and tools, uh, and uh, we cannot um, quantify anything. We don't. We cannot give any numbers. However, uh, when we plan some future scenarios, which are possible, probable, preferable, we should also consider worst case scenario. And this is what I would like to uh, bring to your attention, mostly using this perspective of. Uh, feminist approach. And here, um, I understand the place of philosophy in general, and especially feminist philosophy in particular, not as a total critic of the idea of our presence in space. Uh, I, I would say that philosophy can support or maybe even should support our space exploration, because this is probably the next inevitable step of our presence in space. However, my, my point is that philosophy uh, in general and feminism in particular may be used to prepare us for possible wrong scenarios, mostly in ethical issues, in moral matters, social, political issues. This is what I see as, as a valuable, as, as a possible, uh, valuable contribution of um, philosophical reflection in space. So we can say that this kind of uh, skepticism and, and critical thinking is for our benefits uh, in our future space exploration. Um, I think that um, uh, one of mistakes in our philosophical thinking about our future in space is something what we can call moral exceptionalism. Moral exceptionalism means that we assume that in some specific environments, uh, which we can call demanding extreme environments, uh, we have a right to lower our high moral standards. Uh, already on Earth, we have a lot of such environments um, in times of crisis like wars, uh, conflicts, terrorist attack, pandemics or epidemics we usually accept some uh, limits and restrictions on, of our freedom, autonomy, possibly some human rights. We can talk about a kind of state paternalism in such contexts. The question is what we will do um, when we will explore 
uh, when we will explore space in more advanced way if we are also prone to um, to limit our moral standards at least in the beginning of our presence in space at least in the beginning of some hypothetical future space settlement if something like this ever happen but this problem of uh, moral exceptionalism um, uh, will not exist without uh, the question of universal moral norms because if there is anything universal about morality um, we we don't need to be worried about possible exemptions of about possible exemptions from universal moral norms because there is anything universal in morality we can always assume that um, this particular set of norms moral principles moral rules can be applied only in a particular society times and place however on the other side i think that uh, probably each of us um, uh, would like to believe in something like universal moral norms or intuitively we feel that that must be something universal about morality so what about universal moral norms in space what about universal moral norms on earth um, to ask this question we can reverse the order and ask about so-called absolute moral constraints absolute moral constraints mean such kind of actions and behaviors which are always forbidden independently on the context and some of philosophers and ethicists think that uh, such absolute moral constraints, it means behaviors which are also bad, uh, they include, for instance, rape, torture, enslavement. Uh, we don't see in this list uh, uh, killing because uh, in some circumstances, uh, killing someone else can be allowed, like in the case of uh, self-defense, for instance. So this. Uh, this is not anything which is always forbidden. However, uh, regarding rape, the, uh, you, you cannot rape anyone and, and look for some moral justification. You cannot rape anyone and say that it was for some higher purposes or for someone else's benefits. The same about enslavement, the same about torture. However, for some, the example of torture is questionable. But uh, why this issue matter for uh, discussion about morality in space because uh, because when we see that um, already on earth we are able to find barely few examples of possible absolute moral constraints and not all of them like the case of torture is accepted by everyone we may expect that the more difficult will be to find absolute moral constraints in space which is very demanding and very extreme environment and uh, some of philosophers like uh, like especially uh, james schwartz think that we shouldn't lower our moral standards in space even in the beginning of uh, le let's let's imagine some future hypothetical um, permanent or uh, semi-permanent human base in space maybe some kind of space settlement even for a relatively small group of people. Some of philosophers, as mentioned, Schwartz, think that uh, we shouldn't lower our moral standards from the very beginning. Because uh, uh, some of philosophers and ethicists think that we may uh, lower, uh, we may, we may lower uh, some of our high moral standards, at least in the beginning, because of extremity of this space environment and such difficult project like space exploration and human long-term presence in space we should do our best to keep as high standards and as possible but uh, some of them think that lowering such standards may be uh, unavoidable at least in the beginning however first is telling something something else that in such demanding environments like will be space environment or space based or space settlement we don't have a right to lower our you know, our moral standards and he gives good example uh, how it looks on earth and how it looks on uh, space and that we shouldn't uh, that we shouldn't compare uh, space to earth in the sense of uh, demanding char uh, character 
of uh, environment uh, because as as Schwartz uh, as, far, as Schwartz shows when we talk about demanding environment on earth we have already a lot of societies with long history with <clears throat> with very complex and complicated history which are in a permanent process of creation determined by uh, by many factors and uh, we can only try to reform such societies, but we cannot create them from the very beginning. In space, on the other side, there is no society. So when we will be ready to uh, send people for uh, loner presence in space and create some kind of society, um, more or less permanent, we will get the unique opportunity to create them from the very beginning, keeping high moral standards. And we can also say, repeating after Schwarz that um, this is a kind of moral obligation because of the progress in humanities and social sciences. I mean, mostly our knowledge about mechanisms of oppression and exclusion, knowing how, uh, how many populations were excluded, colonized, oppressed, enslaved. Uh, having this knowledge about these mechanisms, we should try to not uh, repeat them in any new society both on earth and and in space and uh, in my philosophical reflection i think that um, having in mind this uh, feminist conceptual framework where feminism is interested especially in dynamics and mechanisms of oppression exclusion domination discrimination and others i think that um, regarding our future presence in space we may expect that uh, some types of oppression can be minimized or eliminated. I think probably races or classes. However, maybe a little bit paradoxically, other types of oppression can be even stronger. And I have in mind mostly uh, oppression of uh, disabled people and women. Um, my point is that um, using this framework of feminist philosophy, because of the specificity of future space settlement, as well as our our uh, sexist, our ablaze, our um, race, uh, our our discriminative ideas. Um, this oppression of of women and disabled people can be even stronger than 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 is currently on Earth. And uh, one of evidence that it can be the case. Is, uh, is the phenomenon which we know on earth as genderization of medical care. Uh, genderization of medical care means that uh, the role uh, in the context of space medicine, for instance, means that because of the current relatively marginal role of women in space exploration, our knowledge about their health, about their medical safety in space is not sufficient to allow them safe participation in future uh, future uh, space programs. So consequently, we may try to exclude women from any broader participation in future space mission because of our uh, not uh, sufficient knowledge about their health and safety in space. What of course will be, uh, what can be read as a kind of uh, paternalistic concern about their well-being, but on the other side will have definitely, or will be caused definitely by, um, in some sense, sexist and exclusionary ideas. Uh, what we have already on Earth is uh, male-centered medicine, and if we will not, uh, we, if we will not start to treat women equally with men, regarding also our um, time and resources which we spend on research. We can also expect male centered uh, medicine uh, in the context of space. Um, regarding this point, very important for feminist approach to space, like power structures, exclusion, um, discrimination, not in space, but in space policy, when in the global context, uh, only, only usually, usually only. Um, uh, space-faring superpowers are able to make some substantive progress in space exploration. 
Uh, my point, uh, what I would like to only, I, I would like to comment briefly only one point. I mean, um, uh, this uh, accusation of uh, capitalism, so-called fundamentalist capitalist or disaster capitalist, this is what we can meet in many works. Um, I find this case very paradoxical because the problem is that it looks like only uh, private corporations are uh, maybe really interested in making some progress uh, in space and in space exploration. So even if we will, even if we say and if we agree that not everything in this capitalist model of of, uh, of exploration and business works good because we have exclusion and oppression of many people, we have big poverty. Uh, in a, in a so-called global south and a lot of poor and excluded people in global north, etc., um, etc., et probably only these private corporations are um, the only player and uh, actor in this, let's say, space race or uh, current space policy, who can be really interested in doing some projects in space, of course, how it will look uh, from practical and economical point of view. It's not my field of, of expertise. Anyway, I, find, I, I found such kind of maybe a little bit paradoxical uh, dynamics. So uh, I will maybe skip this issue of exclusion and this critique of capitalism. And I will, uh, I will now uh, move to my another point, I mean the idea of human enhancement. This is the topic which I, I am interested from a uh, long time. And um, the idea of human enhancement means that we want to improve um, future astronauts, future space settlers by biomedical means, for instance, gene editing, by pharma pharmaceuticals, by some kind of brain computer interfaces to adapt them better to demanding space environment. This idea itself is, is not, um, it's not problematic, mostly in the context of space. Uh, we can even say that it's very rational and reasonable as long as this procedure would be safe and effective because someone would, would, could ask, what can be wrong that you want to improve, that you want to increase safety and performance of future deep space mission astronauts and space settlers? If, they, if you will keep them safe and effective, there is nothing problematic, and this is true. However, uh, uh, from feminist point of view, there is one problem connected to the concept of the norm. Uh, already on Earth, we have a lot of problems caused by the concept of the norm and the, the way how this normalization paradigm works on Earth. I mean that... Um, uh, for instance, one of the examples is in uh, usually in, in medicine and healthcare, but not only, that uh, male body, not female body, is treated as, as the norm. Female body is usually considered as something abnormal or pathological. So this is one of example examples what we understand by the concept of norm or what we understand in practice by the concept of the ideal. The same about education. If we have in classroom different kind of children regarding their cognitive performance, we can also create some kind of norm. Who is below the norm? It's, it's something wrong with these children. This is the way how we think, uh, how people usually think. So the same about disabled people. We define them as disabled because they are, uh, because they don't match some kind of norm or some kind of ideal which we created. So this is the point that our normalization paradigm and the concept of norm, they follow, they usually follow biases which we have regarding gender, race, disability. So we construct socially um, norm, we construct socially, um, for instance, health disease and, and other uh, concepts. And the, the problem is that we can also construct socially uh, this concept of the norm regarding space. And here we come to the point where we find that technology can be oppressive. This is again a little bit paradoxical because we 
uh, we put a lot of trust to science and technology. Uh, however, technology can be also the tool of oppression. I mean, mostly medical technologies and the way how they can work uh, towards women like digital health technologies or assisted reproductive technologies. Here, feminist philosophy um, uh, show us, uh, shows us that this medical technologies increase the risk of permanent monitoring of women, what means that uh, in the future space base, mostly if our reproduction in space would be possible, let's imagine that something like this uh, one day in the future will be possible in space, uh, we may expect that uh, women will be under special pressure and special monitoring using mostly this highly advanced medical technologies, at least for two reasons. First reason is, um, first reason is women um, reproductive biology and their expected substantial role <coughs> in future reproduction in space. The second reason is that they are women. It means that they are relatively new in usually masculinist environment and it is possible the women will be expected to show their performance. Women will be expected to show that they are as, um, as good as men. Uh, and uh, for this reason also, we, we shouldn't ignore some possible paternalism lying behind. Women may be under special, uh, special monitoring. This is, why, this is what I mean uh, talking about uh, the risk of special oppression of women in space, this particular group um, in our future presence in space. And of course, the second group, uh, disabled people, both of them can be uh, some kind of victims of the policy of human enhancement for space, if such policy will be ever applied. I mean, some kind of radical human enhancement. What is also problematic with this uh, concept of human enhancement that we want to improve future astronauts and space setters by biomedical means. The second problem is connected with uh, the fact that every human policy, every human enhancement policy applied in space may be very restrictive and exclusionary because in both variants, which are considered by philosophers, I mean, human enhancement as mandatory or human enhancement as um, voluntary, always we will have some group of people um, who will not get this enhancement because they don't want, because they, they are not able um, and something like this. So always um, applying such requirement, we should expect some part of excluded people. And my last example, uh, definitely related to far future in space, is human reproduction in space. I think we should assume that uh, people in space will have sexual life, people will have, will reproduce. And if we treat um, as uh, some philosophers, uh, visionaries, science fiction authors, that um, space will be also a kind of space refuge to save uh, human species. I think to get meaning, uh, to give meaning to such idea, we have to reproduce. We, we should provide next generations because if space settlement uh, is designed only for this one generation which will settle space, uh, probably there are good reasons to not realize such such big and expensive project. What is problematic about human reproduction on Earth that we already have a lot of ideas, stereotypes, uh, norms, how reproduction should work. We have a lot of ethical systems, political systems, and usually these ideas and norms are very unfavorable to women. Feminists in general, um, with, with some exemptions, of course, but a lot of feminists, at least uh, second wave feminists, they showed that female reproduction 
is the source of female oppression. Uh, so, um, some of feminists show that, um, and they showed mostly in the second wave feminist period that this, uh, uh, that uh, not uh, female reproductive biology as such caused uh, women oppression, but um, our society and the way how we treated women, the way what we expected from women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, uh, we we may say that despite uh, this different uh, view, different views inside feminists about reproduction and oppression, we can say that not necessarily reproduction and reproductive technologies as such can be restrictive and problematic, as rather the way how they work under conditions of patriarchy and uh, sexism. And here, uh, many uh, many feminists uh, they are talking about such issues like techno maternity paradigm on Earth, which may increase in space about uh, pressure to reproduce, and the risk that space and environment will make this pressure uh, to reproduce, for instance, um, uh, only stronger in space. And also what is problematic um, about our reproductive policies as we know them historically and currently on earth, that they are, that, that with, uh, with some rare exemptions, they usually affect only women, very rare men, usually women. And uh, women are usually blamed for everything related to reproduction, for overpopulation or for um, low fertility rate, women are expected to sacrifice themselves. Or it does not matter what kind of policy we will take. It can be antinatalist. Um, antinatalist means that uh, we think that it is better to not reproduce or we want, or this is, if this is a kind of social policy, we want to limit reproduction of all women or some kind of women. On the other side, we have pronatalist, more pronatalist policy, which means that we mm, that we expect women to reproduce, or at least some group of women. In both cases, women are this size, which is blamed and criticized and expected to some kind of sacrifices, because some of women don't want to have children, but they are expected to have. On the other side, some of women want to have children, but mm, they are forbidden uh, there, uh, but uh, this um, people who create uh, such kind of reproductive policy, they don't want this woman uh, they, to, to reproduce. So what about uh, possible future reproductive policy in space? I think that um, we may expect uh, some kind of discrimination, even during selection process. I mean that um, we may prefer women who will agree or who will declare, declare their willingness to reproduce. On the other side, we may discriminate all those candidates who don't want or who cannot reproduce. So uh, we may expect um, that um, disabled people or people sexually non-binary may be not welcome in future space society because they will not match this reproductive, usually heterosexual idea. So this is what uh, taking this conceptual uh, lenses of uh, feminist philosophy, I think we can expect in space, or at least this is one hypothetical worst case scenario, which can happen even if we don't want such scenario, we can even declare that we are against. Uh, but because of some specific dynamics of space environment and some specific dynamics of space settlement, we can, uh, in some sense, by accident, um, uh, lead to such, um, such uh, controversial and uh, discriminatory society. And, uh, the, uh, and to come to conclusion regarding this uh, case of reproduction in space, even if we will, even if we agree that uh, our reproduction space is unavoidable and 
some group of women, any group of women must reproduce in space in way, one way or another. What is problematic from feminist philosophical perspective, there are reproductive rights and procreative autonomy of this individual woman who in one time will decide not to reproduce or will decide, for instance, to, uh, to have abortion. So this is uh, what, uh, so this is the question, what about reproductive rights of such women? And uh, my last uh, idea, which I would like to share with you, uh, many philosophers, social scientists from years, they talk about macho culture in space. This is this cultural background, which is definitely a domain of uh, our thinking about space, domain of, domain of space policy and space culture. It may be really problematic because as one of consequences of this macho culture regarding space environment, uh, we are not able, we are even not able to think about astronauts like about weak average people. Rather, we associate astronauts with outstanding health, performance, efficiency. And this is what we may expect from them regarding uh, future long-term missions or possible space uh, settlement. So in consequence of such uh, macho ideal or macho culture in space, if we reproduce in space in future space settlement, there is a risk that we will create such kind of eugenics policy where we will expect to bring to space the fittest children. And to do this, we may monitor and control women, and we can also blame them for everything what is, what is wrong. And uh, some final thoughts. First, I think that um, it, it is good to include feminist critic and feminist ideas uh, in our thinking about our future in space. Uh, some of these feminist ideas are definitely, um, they can be definitely read as controversial, as radical. Uh, for some of them, uh, pro for, for some of us, this feminist critic may be even a little bit um, um, exaggerated. And uh, But anyway, I think that we have a kind of moral obligation to include in our thinking about our future in space, this all our knowledge, mostly which we got thanks to uh, feminist thinking about dynamics and causes of oppression, discrimination, sexist, racist. Now in, in, in 21st century, I think we don't have moral right to ignore this knowledge and to pretend that uh, these processes will never happen because we know what we did as humanity on earth regarding other nations, regarding, um, regarding environment, regarding non-animal species. Uh, second, um, I wanted to show that uh, because of specific dynamics of space environment, as well as our uh, discriminatory ideas, which, we, we, which some of us have because of our biases, there is a risk that some kind of discriminations and oppressions, which we know from Earth, mostly oppression and discrimination of disabled people, oppression and discrimination of women, they can be not only duplicated, but even reinforced in our, in, in our uh, future base or future settlement. And um, my last thought is, but I didn't elaborate. I, I I didn't elaborate too much in my presentation. Just um, regarding this, uh, this is my last thought related to the paradoxical role played by uh, capitalists in space, where the inherent part of feminist critic is the total critic of capitalism because of exploitation, because of uh, inequalities because of discrimination, but on the other side, what I, fi what I find paradoxical is the fact that uh, without capitalism and without this um, private um, projects and private investors, uh, we, we are not able to make 
any progress. So I think this is the biggest challenge, taking into account, of course, this feminist lenses, how we want to keep uh, equality in the access to space, how we want to avoid discrimination and exclusion both on Earth and in space, simultaneously being uh, uh, simultaneously um, being dependent fully on this uh, uh, capitalist powers and capitalist factors, which are usually blamed for this negative phenomenon. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. We have just uh, four minutes left and we have some questions. So uh, let me read it all at once and please take uh, one minute each of you to address uh, all of any part of this, okay? Thank you so much. Uh, so first question is from Jean Corpus Valencia. It says, if human settlements or activities are established on celestial bodies, how should we approach the rights and interests of indigenous peoples who may have cultural or historical connections to those places? And a uh, second question uh, that is actually asking to the first one is, uh, do you mean potential life forms that have already exist on those celestial bodies by the time we colonize them? And finally, the third question by Chen Si uh, Puch, it says, uh, we are already dealing with the ethical impact of changing the night sky through the satellite visibility and light pollution from the ground, from rocket launches, and from orbital scattering. Colonization um, of the moon will result in changes to the view of the moon and commercial space travel will have similar impacts. Uh, for example, a space elevator will change the view of the sky in a region of the globe. Uh, so the question is, how should the rights of the people that remain on the earth interact with the rights of those electing to travel and or colonize? And that will be it. If any of you want to address it, please, we have uh, two more minutes. Okay, well, I'll start and I'll be brief. Um, I think the biggest play that can happen is with the United Nations. We expect too much of that organization. They're meeting right now and don't seem very productive, but we need new space law. We need new space treaties. There's a working, there's a committee for the peaceful uses of outer space that's been meeting annually for 60 years. And it's working slowly towards new space treaties, which would deal with some of these issues. The United Nations is the body that could deal with the equity issues of the global South and of indigenous populations. Um, and at least there has been one space treaty, which most countries sign. So that's maybe a slender hope that the United Nations can be efficient enough to develop new laws and treaties. Um, but that's probably the only body with enough oversight and enough buy-in from the nations of the world to tackle some of these issues. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Conrad, a final thought? I would like to only say uh, one word, maybe not uh, directly related to these questions, that it's it's good to include in our thinking about space also cultural background and and uh, cultural richness of uh, other than Eurocentric and Western cultures. I mean, um, uh, we bring with us our um, history of colonialism, even if we blame ourselves for for this. Anyway, this is usually the way how we look at the world in our future in space. So it's good also to take into account uh, other cultures, other religious systems from Asia, from Africa, the way how they look at space, not necessarily in terms of exploitation. Uh, and and this, is, this is my uh, final conclusion. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to uh, both of you. It was uh, wonderful to hear all these uh, topics and different aspects of the ethics and uh, thank you for the attendees too and uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference in just uh, 10 minutes if you want to join again room two we will have the panel considerations on space technology and innovation 
So thank you so much for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for moderating. Of course. Hi, Conrad. Hi, Sophia.